Magic City Books here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're so thrilled to have you with us for our ongoing virtual author event series, which we have been doing uh, for about a year now. We've done well over 130 of these uh, virtual events in that time and had, you know, such a great, it's been such a great tool to stay connected with our audience, to meet new people, to reach people who would never be in town or in the state. And so uh, we're going to keep doing these probably for a little while. We are looking at, you know, summer, fall, thinking when we may reemerge into the real world and how that might look, maybe some outdoor things as we're all getting vaccinated, which I hope all of you are doing, uh, if it's available to you. Um, but yeah, we're going to keep doing this. And we have a bunch of stuff coming up this spring. I won't go through the list, but I would encourage you to go to our website. Uh, tomorrow, though, I will mention one thing. We're going to be doing an event tomorrow evening at 7 Central uh, with Amanda Tyler, who's a professor, a law professor at Berkeley. And uh, she was the co-author of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's final book, which just came out. Came out and. Um, was a clerk with Justice Ginsburg and, and uh, worked closely with her in the last period of her life on this book. Um, so we're gonna be talking about, about all of that. And, you know, talking about some of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's ties here in Oklahoma. She lived here for a, a fair amount of time, several years, had her daughter here when she was in Oklahoma. So there's some good statewide connections there. So that's tomorrow night, free and open to everybody. Uh, and then check the website for everything else coming up. I will mention one thing, uh, this spring, May and June, we will be doing a lot of events uh, around the centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. A lot of programs around that. We have everybody from Don Lemon from CNN who'll be doing a program with us to Carol Anderson for a new book on the Second Amendment. Uh, a lot of different things. Um, so that's going to be late May, early June. Um, I will say by way of June, June 1st is going to be an important day because that is the day how the Word is Passed by Clint Smith is coming into the world. And Clint is gonna be our guest moderator for tonight. He's a wonderful writer at The Atlantic. Um, I'm always thrilled when we uh, have, have a uh, guest moderator because I can be one of you guys and just watch the talk and, and, and sit back and enjoy it. So we're really thrilled to have Clint uh, with us tonight. Um, On to the event at hand. Patrick Ragenkeefe uh, does not know this, but he was a, a big part of my life in the pandemic because I read Say Nothing, and I listened to Wind of Change, his wonderful podcast, during this last crazy year. And, and uh, it, those were two things that really uh, helped me use my time wisely. I mean, say nothing. Um, you know, it's, it's been praised all over the place, so it won't be new for anybody to say this, but I think it's one of our, our great nonfiction books of the last five or 10 years. And it covers the troubles in Northern Ireland and, and um, kind of knocked my socks off uh, when, when I did it. I loved it so much, I'll be honest with you. I read it and then I listened to it on audio and it has this wonderful female narrator whose name I forget with a beautiful Irish accent that kind of it was like a, a movie in your ears. So I would encourage you, if you've read it too, to go ahead and listen to it. And then Wind of Change, this crazy podcast about the scorpions and the Cold War. And, you know, it reminded me of being a little kid in the 80s worrying that the Russians were going to bomb me in my bed at night. So it brought back some fun and, you know, not so fun memories, but it was a great podcast. Um, I was thrilled to see that he had a new book coming. It was kind of a surprise to all of us, I think. It had been embargoed a little bit that this book, Empire of Pain, uh, was coming. And, and um, I'd been following the story of, of Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family for some time. And I was mentioning we've been doing a, what a little bit of a series on the opioid crisis here in America over these past few years. We've done several events uh, dealing with that. Um, you'll hear a bit tonight probably about the 2019 case here in Oklahoma dealing with Purdue Pharma, which was a pretty landmark case and this and plays a part of, of the story you're going to hear tonight. But um, when you see this book, Empire of Pain, you're going to wonder having heard what I just said about Patrick, what he's been doing, not to mention the great work he's been doing at the New Yorker as a staff writer over there, how this happened and how he actually pulled all this stuff together because it's an amazingly researched book. It is a uh, one of those books that has a narrative flow to it that whether you know one thing or a million things about this topic, you'll find something compelling here, which is I think the mark of a really great writer. Um, and I will mention this too. Hopefully, you guys will be buying a copy of this book from us tonight. I shouldn't have to bribe you, and there should be no reason you should just want to do that. But tonight, we work often with many organizations in our community, and there's a great community uh, organization here in town called the Oklahoma Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, and we're going to be giving 20% of every book sold tonight to that organization because they're doing on-the-ground work 
here in our community and the state uh, dealing with the opioid epidemic and uh, helping people uh, on a person to person basis. So as if you need more reasons to buy this book, that's just one more to do so and click that button tonight. So we'll keep putting links in the chat here so you can do that. Um, and if you have questions, there will be many. This is a compelling topic and you're gonna have many questions. Please put those into the Q&A and Clint, who's our moderator tonight, will be uh, pulling some of those to uh, ask throughout the conversation. So. All that being said, I need a drink of water because I just said a whole lot of things. So I'm gonna do that, sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Patrick, for doing this event. Congratulations on the book uh, and all the work you've done. I've just, and you've been kind of on my uh, Mount Rushmore of cultural people for the last year. And Clint, thank you for joining us as guest moderator. I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it is a, a true honor and pleasure to be here. I, what is clear now is that I'm going to have to uh, fight Jeff to be named the, the president of the Say Nothing fan club. Uh, I thought that I was the president and then Jeff came in, came in with a strong platform. Uh, and so uh, I too um, encountered Say Nothing over the course of the pandemic. And you know, it was one of those books that I, top 10 New York Times, one this, one that, some places were, you know, rightfully naming it best book of the decade. And I was like, like, you know, let's, okay. All right, everybody, <laughs> let's, let's see, let's, let's hold our horses. I was like, let me see what this, this say nothing is about. Um, and I had of course read Patrick in the, uh, in New Yorker for years, but uh, I think as any writer will tell you the, the sort of space, any magazine writer, um, I think the space that you have to, to work within a book uh, creates a, it's a sort of a fundamentally different creative and intellectual project than what you're able to do in the space of, you know, even a long form magazine piece. So uh, Say Nothing as it has to almost everyone who's read it uh, blew me away. And uh, I was like, there's no way, you know, that he won. And then I saw Empire Pain and I was like, didn't Say Nothing just come out? But uh, Patrick is a is a busy and and prolific prolific writer, and so I was like, well, there's I don't know if he could have done it again, um, but he did do it again. Uh, it is it is an extraordinary book. I spent the past five days post embargo, um, sort of digging into it um, as much as I can. My my kids, my four year old and my two year old, are like, you know, I was I was a little bit of a derelict father over the past five days, so that I could finish Empire of Pain. I was like quiet, the Sacklers, it's the Sacklers, it's something. Um, but no, all that's to say, thank you all so much for coming. Um, please make sure before you do anything, sometimes there's this thing where people are like, oh, I'm gonna buy the book, like I'm gonna tune in first, I'll buy the book later, you keep the tab open. Don't keep the tab open, buy it now. You can feel good that you purchased the book or several copies of the book for your parents, your grandparents, your children um, before the, the talk even begins. So go ahead and push the, uh, the order button, um, make sure you order it from this, uh, this great place. And so we're going to dig right in. And I have a lot of, I have so many questions. Um, a lot of them, some of them writerly, um, just on craft level. I'm, I'm so curious how so much, how you pulled off so much of this. But I think just to sort of start us off, if you can talk a little bit about You've, you've written across such a range of different topics, you know, over the course of your career. Um, and I'm curious how, how you came to this topic and, and how you decided it was worthy of, of a book length treatment. Uh, great question. Um, and I should say thank you. Uh, thank you, Cliff, for doing this. Um, thank you, Jeff and, and Magic City and all of you who are, are joining us. Um, the book just came out yesterday, so this is all very new. Uh, to me, even just talking about it is new, um, but it's a thrill to be able to do this uh, with you. And, and uh, I thank you all. Um, I, it's a weird one. You know, this started as a piece in the New Yorker in 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, I had actually done a fair amount of writing about drugs. And I, I was very interested in um, drug prohibition, the war on drugs, the consequences of that. Um, I was interested in drug cartels in Mexico and the whole kind of cross-border illegal drug trade. Um, I did a big story for the New Yorker. This is probably, God, I don't remember, it's probably 20, maybe 2014, about the legalization of cannabis in Washington state 
and just, you know, when you take an illicit drug economy and you, you make it illicit, what does that look like from a regulatory point of view? Um, and at a certain point, I noticed that the, the Mexican drug cartels were sending more and more Mexican heroin into the United States. And that was a kind of a riddle for me. I, I couldn't figure out why initially. And I started reading up on it and learned that, you know, there was this connection to the, the illicit pharmaceutical sector in this country uh, and to the opioid crisis, which was already kind of burgeoning at that point. Um, and when you start reading about the opioid crisis, you, you know, before long, you'll, you'll come upon Purdue Pharma. Um, there's, it, it sounds as though at, at Magic City Books, you guys have done events with a number of um, authors who've written terrific books about the opioid crisis. So you'll be familiar perhaps with some of the history, um, <clears throat> but Purdue Pharma, you know, marketed and, and produced this drug OxyContin. Um, and you would often read in like the margins of these stories about Purdue that the company was, was a private company. It was owned by this family, the Sackler family. And that uh, they actually were this kind of very wealthy philanthropic dynasty who were known chiefly for their generosity to art museums and uh, universities. And that often their name would be on kind of halls and galleries and buildings. Um, and this struck me as, as just a very weird disconnect. And what I set out to do in the piece originally was to tell the story of the family's relationship with the company in a way that it hadn't been told before. So, so previously you'd had, like a lot of the time you'd have the, the Sacklers as kind of one strand in a tapestry where you also have, you know, Purdue and you've got government investigators and doctors and people who are struggling with opioid use disorders and you're getting all these characters kind of intertwining. And there were a series of very good books that, that took that kind of approach. Um, I wanted to take a different approach and, uh, and just look at the family head on, just center stage, really just focus on them. So I did that in the piece in 2017. And um, it's funny, you know, my last, I've had three books now that have all grown out of New Yorker pieces. Um, you, you know, in some ways, Clint, I'm sure you have a serious, a, a, a similar uh, experience where you, you know, you write a big piece that takes you months and months and it's many thousands of words and you put it out in the world. And there's this question of like, have I scratched that itch? Am I done? Or is this actually just the beginning of something? Um, and initially I thought I was done because I wrote this piece and the family is incredibly secretive. Like at that point in 2017, they had never, no member of this family had ever given an interview about the family business. Mm. And the company was privately held. So, you know, I'm, I'm an investigative reporter. I, I tend to be pretty good about digging out documents, but it's really hard with a secretive privately held company to do that. And so at that point, I, I figured there's not a book here because I knew that if I was going to do a book, I would want it to feel somewhat intimate. You know, like I, I knew that the family wouldn't talk to me. So the question was, is there a way to write the book where you won't feel like, you know, they're up in a tower and you're looking at them through a telescope? Because that to me would not be very satisfying. I, I wouldn't want to read that book, much less write it. But what happened with, was that there's all this litigation against the company and, I, and increasingly against the family now with, with states suing them. And in that process, a bunch of internal documents came out. And then another thing started happening, which is that the people started reaching out to me, kind of coming out of the woodwork, where mm -hmm. one of the nice things about, you know, you write an article in a national magazine, and I think of it as it's like, you know, it's like putting the, the bat signal up in the sky because you're saying like, I'm, I'm interested in this, I'm writing on this. And so people started getting in touch, just finding me and saying, oh, you know, I've known the family, uh, you know, I worked for them or I know them socially or I worked at Purdue Pharma. Um, and so gradually I began to think, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's something bigger here, a, a book that I could write. And as someone who, you know, now you've done, you've written, you know, your long New Yorker pieces, you've done, um, several books, but you've also recently, you did a podcast, like this extended narrative podcast. And I'm curious, now that you've, you're sort of operating in different mediums, was there, how do you decide, how do you decide that winds of change that that necessitated or was, was best suited for sort of a podcast format? And then something like this was best suited for a book. Like, did you ever think that, oh, what would it be like to do a Sackler, you know, dynasty, 
podcast series? You know, I, I'm curious yeah, how yeah. you make those those sorts of decisions. I mean, I think that's a great question. And I know you've thought about this because we because we talked about this yesterday, but you know, in terms of you're a poet as well as a journalist, right? And there's questions about um uh I'm sure similar questions, right? I mean different in their particulars, but similar in the flavor, right? About what does this inquiry want to be? Right. Um I mean, with Window Change, it was there was a very simple reason, which is that <laughs> that I had to do it as a podcast, which is that um, I, over the years writing writing magazine articles, I have come to believe pretty firmly that um, if if it's a mystery story and you don't solve the mystery, you don't want to write that as a magazine article. I mean, people do it, and some sometimes people really pull it off. But in my experience, if there's something about readers, if they if if it's a long magazine article yeah. and somebody gives you 45 minutes of their life, and then at the end you're like, and we'll never know, <laughs> uh, they tend to be pissed off. You know, they want they want their hour back. Right. Um, and there's this weird thing that I noticed about podcasting, which I still don't feel like I entirely understand, which is that, I mean, to take the most archetypal example, like serial, the first serial you know, hinges on this question, did Adnan do it or did he not do it? And you get to the end of Serial and they're like, and we'll never know. <laughs> and um, and for some reason, I mean, that pissed some people off, but I think for for many, many, many people, it was kind of more about the, the process. Mm. Um, I mean, the cliche is more about the journey than, than, than the destination. But I, I think podcasting is a very intimate medium and a kind of a forgiving medium. Mm. You've got this voice in your ear. Like I'm not, I'm not that voice here, writer, but I feel like even the voiciest writer on the page, it's no comparison to like mm. you're you're in somebody's earbud, like yeah. talking right into their brain. You know, it, they they develop a different relationship with you. Right. Um, with this with this book, I don't know. I I think um, I sort of saw it. I at a certain point there were all these emails, and you know, I made I made this pretty big choice early on, which is that I felt as though, again, this was not just an Oxycontin book or an opioid crisis book. I wanted to do a kind of big, um, a big sweeping family history with mm -hmm. all of the drama and the different generations. And I knew that I wanted to really focus on Arthur Sackler, who was the, you know, the, uh, one of these three brothers. And so, and that Arthur would probably be a, th a third of the book. He'd be like the whole first third of the book. Um, and, and all that stuff came to me pretty quickly. And at that point I could kind of see the book in my mind's eye. Then it was just mm -hmm. a question of, can you, can you achieve on paper, you know, the thing that you're imagining? And when did you start writing it sort of in earnest? So I didn't, I, what happened was that the, you know, there have been a whole bunch of states that have sued. I mean, I think literally 49 states that have sued Purdue Pharma over mm -hmm. its role uh, in helping spark the opioid, opioid crisis and spark and, and perpetuate the opioid crisis mm -hmm. through fraudulent marketing of, uh, of opioids. Um, but nobody had sued the Sacklers themselves. Mm -hmm. There's this weird thing where there's this family that owns the company and actually was dominated the board of the company. And, you know, a number of them were senior executives in the company, um, but they were always kind of untouchable. Um, and then in, in early 2019, the attorney general of Massachusetts unveiled this complaint in which she named a bunch of the individual members of the Sackler family as defendants. And she had this amazing kind of roadmap of internal emails and so forth. And it was funny because I, I, the, this came out, there was like a day of press coverage where the newspapers covered it. It was like a, it was several hundred pages long, this complaint. So there were these newspaper stories and I read them and took an interest. And then probably a week went by and I thought, you know, I should really go and read the original document rather than just the secondary coverage. And I started reading it and I was, I was like live tweeting as I was reading it and I just, and screenshotting stuff. And it was just one of those things where I could not believe. Hmm. I'd spent so long trying to imagine, like unable to interview the Sacklers, I wondered like, how do they talk privately? How does it look to them? And honestly, I think I probably, in my, in my imagination, I probably wasn't being all that generous to them. Hmm. I was probably pretty cynical and I didn't know the half of it. It was so much worse than yeah. like the worst version of it that I could have imagined when you saw the way they spoke privately. And so at that point I thought, oh, I think there's a book here. And I, I really, I, uh, you know, talked to my, my editor who had edited Say Nothing. Say Nothing was about to come out at that point. And, um, 
and I got going and I didn't, but I didn't actually do this. So then it was all research, research, research. And I didn't actually do the writing until the pandemic. Got it. Uh, and is that how your process typically works? Do you usually do sort of research beforehand and then go in and do the writing in sort of one felt swoop or is it, or is there, are they entangled with one another? Or are you kind of moving back and forth? It's, um, I mean, the, the kind of glib answer would be that it, for me, it's like, you know, it's like eight parts research to two parts writing or really nine parts research to one part writing. And that it happens more or less in that order. Uh, the thing that I really obsess over and that I think I've gotten better this is my fourth book. And I feel like I'm slow, slowly learning uh, as I go. And um, one thing I've gotten a lot better at is, um, so I don't start writing until really late, but I do start outlining really early. So, mm -hmm. You know, I had this this realization. I think this is probably around the time I started doing Say Nothing, that I I just love research. And I love doing it. It's kind of my element, and um, I probably would have been a happy academic just hanging in the archives. And um, but but as a consequence, it can be super inefficient because the I find everything so interesting. Yeah always a little rabbit hole. I mean, you see this a little bit with, uh, with wind of change actually, where I'm like, the great thing is I was able to go down some of those rabbit holes, but it's like, you know, you're kind of moving in one direction and then there's, it, or, or let me change my hackneyed metaphor. Uh, you know, it's like a tree, right. And you've got the kind of trunk of the tree, but then it branches off here and there. Like how far do you go in those branches? And I, I, um, I just realized at a certain point that like I could keep researching forever because it's like you learn about one interesting character and then there's their background and then you realize oh god there there's three books I really need to read and I'm going to understand that and that connects you to something else and um so what I try and do now is impose a structure pretty early on just to, to put like some kind of left right parent like some guardrails on my own research so that I have a sense when I stumble on something in the archive or I find some new character or there's some new article that I'm desperately trying to get my hands on or a transcript or whatever it is where I can kind of know like it's worth spending like two or three days um trying to chase this down because if you find it it'll it'll go in the bucket that's like going to go in the book not in the bucket that you know is not going to go in the book you know talk to me about um you know, one of the, the things about say not, both Say Nothing and Empire of Pain is that it is clear that you are operating with just, t I mean, tens of thousands of pages of, of, of documents from the archive, from these um, legal briefings, from these, uh, you know, from, from all sorts of, of, of different sources. Um, and also that you are incorporating hundreds of your own interviews. But what's fascinating is that, and I think what makes these books read like novels is that you're not really, I mean, probably 98% of the time, like as I'm reading, I can almost note of when it's different, but like, you're not really saying this person said, or this person told me, or uh, this, per and, and what it creates is, you know, cause, sometimes that can create a sort of start stop um, reading experience, right? If it's like this person said, that person said, this person contends, that person argued, you know, um, and it can be done well and gracefully, but, but how, do you, how do you take all of these troves of information and these troves of interviews and transcripts that you've done that now, you know, as we've joked yesterday, that now is, are clearly like laying all across your bed um, for, for the world to see. Um, how do you take that and then sit and then create the, the narrative and pull it all together to create this sort of streamlined narrative? Like, are you, does it, do you just, for, you know, sort of formally and logistically, like, do you go directly from the transcripts and seeing all of them together? Like I met what I imagine you uh, and again, now I imagine you sitting on your, your bed at home. It's like, what's the, the meme of um, Zach Gillikanoff? I can never say his last name. Oh. But there's that meme where, or the gif where all the numbers are, I, I don't even know what movie that's from. But that's yeah. how I imagine your writing process, where it's just like all of the words from the transcripts are like, do, 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 And then they just kind of come together. And, and there's a, a novel about, uh, you know, any, any subject in the world. Um, how do, what is it, 
maybe that is what it looks like for you, but what is it, you know, for <laughs> no. us, for us normal folks? Yeah, um, not at all. The, um, no, I mean, it's pretty, uh, you know, so I use Scrivener, the program, um, just, I don't write books in Scrivener, but I use it as a kind of organizational um, device. It's really about kind of buckets. And so as I'm doing research and I'm PDFing stuff and I've got photos of stuff from archives and I've got my own interview notes and so forth, um, literally there's these like Scrivener buckets that are, you know, it's like young Arthur Sackler in Brooklyn. It's like, you know, like Arthur Sackler's second wife, um, Mortimer Sackler in the South of France, whatever the, the subject is. And I'll just kind of put all the, so rather than have this like big compost heap of stuff, which is how it mm. starts, I'm trying to kind of distribute that into these buckets. And then, um, and then slowly it's just through a lot of outlining, I'm pulling it together. I mean, the thing, I'm really glad to hear you say that about the, the um, you know, the idea that there sometimes is a kind of start stop quality to certain types of writing. And that's something I'm, I'm at great pain. Like I want it to feel very, very fluid. I want to pull you in. Some of the subjects I write about are not, you know, I'm going to say nothing is a good example, right? Like there was not a robust audience of people who were thinking, I want to read a story about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Like it's a tough, I, you know, I wasn't one of those people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think honestly there were, I sort of knew going in that it's going to be, you're going to have to make the case for why people should engage with this story. It's not going to sell itself. And, um, and as a reader, I love nothing more than that feeling of um, just being kind of enveloped and feeling that undertow that you just get sucked in. I mean, that's the number one thing I love as a reader of nonfiction. And then the other thing is when you have these moments where there'll be like a, a little reversal, some little moment where you realize that like the writer is just a couple steps ahead of you and that they've put some thought into you know, when they're going to deal out, I'm mixing my metaphors all over the place, but when they're going to deal out certain cards yeah. that they're kind of, it's, you know, it's not just chronological that they've thought about what you need to know when for the maximum impact. Um, uh, to use a better metaphor, the thing that I always think about is, you know, the, I think the only way to do that, honestly, for me with this kind of journalism is to have a ton of end notes. And I, I think the vast majority of people would never look at the hundred pages or whatever it is of end notes at the end of the book. Um, the, um, I mean, in the case of the Sacklers, that stuff is there partially uh, just in the event that anybody got any, you know, ideas about suing me. Um, you can see where all these claims from come from uh, and how they're grounded in documents. Um, but also I think that you can kind of, um, I feel like I, there's a certain, what I think of it is, that I always think about a duck that like a duck is gliding along the water mm -hmm. and what you see above the water is this duck just serenely gliding along and underneath the water, the duck is furiously paddling. And the paddling is like the end notes for me, you know, it's, it's all the kind of, it's all, it's, it's where you're showing the work, but in terms of what's on the page itself, um, ideally I, I, I want you to not even be thinking about that, not be distracted by questions of sourcing or any of that, just get enveloped in it. And if you have a moment where you want to, you want to like, call BS on me or wonder how it is that I know something, you can always flip to the back of the book and see where that comes from. Got it. Um, getting a little bit into the, the content of the book. Um, there's so many moments. I mean, part of, and we talked a little bit about this, but like part of what I really love and admire about this book and your writing generally is, is as much as these people are engaged in something that feels so evil um, and something that has harmed so many people in such profound ways. There is a like, they, they are not caricatures and they are like three dimensional people who are full human beings who are complicated in their own right and may have done terrible things. Um, or, you know, and that's, you know, even putting it generously in that in some ways. Um, but, but you are always, at least for me as a reader, it is always clear that they are people who are guided by a range of different interests and motivations. And um, as, as we put it, they're not simply the, the person sort of twirling their mustache, you know, at, uh, hoping to inflict pain on millions and millions of people. Um, there is a moment, so, so I think that's just a sort of comment 
um, and something I really admire. And there are still these moments in which these humans, these three-dimensional renderings of these, these people have done these things where you're just like, what, what's the, the example I'm thinking of is there's a moment in book three where the patent for oxycotton, cotton, cotton, oxycotton is about to expire. And the Sacklers know that the generic versions are coming and they appeal to the FDA to reject the generic versions that are using the same formula that their drug used because they're saying now that it's unsafe, even though it was the same formula they used all those years. And then after they did that and the FDA agreed, then they kept selling the thing that they told the FDA was unsafe. They kept selling it in Canada for another year after they had told the FDA that it was too dangerous to, to, to be used in, in the United States. And I think that moment was so, I was just like, what? how do you make sense of those moments? Like, how do you, is it, is it, the, is it just greed? Is it um, per, a profound indifference? Is it like, how do you, when you encounter these moments and I mean, you, that's one example of so much, um, so many of those moments that exist in the book. How do you make sense of motivations? How do you make sense of, of how, how and why something like that happens? Oh man, I mean, I, um, there are a bunch of them where I, where I am just scratching my head. Uh, the, to your point about not wanting to do a, a kind of a caricaturish story about villains, I it, it was important for me. Um, you know, I'm sure the Sacklers would would uh, <laughs> would dispute um, this characterization of the book, but like I, I wanted to make every effort, even though they wouldn't talk to me and tried to shut me down along the way, um, to kind of to empathize as best I could and understand how they see the story and. You know, one theme that I've always been really interested in over the years is just denial and delusion, self-delusion at an individual or a collective level, like whether it's an individual or a family or a community or frankly, you know, a nation. Mm -hmm. um, like what are the stories that you tell yourself about the things that have happened in the past, the things that you've done, which in some cases may be appalling things? Um, like how do you assimilate that? on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, there's an old adage, like Hollywood adage about, you know, in screenwriting that the, um, the villain in the movie never thinks that he's the villain in the movie. Like he thinks he's the hero of the movie, you know? And, um, and that, that was really intriguing to me was to understand how this, how this stuff came to pass. And I, I do think that a lot of it was greed. I think that a lot of it was a kind of, um, arrogance um, and a level of detachment that I think comes with, frankly, comes with being a plutocrat, right? Like if you're, you know, it, it often struck me along the way, and there are other prominent examples of this in American national life in recent years, that if you are a billionaire and you are surrounded by people who depend for their livelihood on like staying in your favor, Mm. Um, that can actually be, you know, that can mean that you are not getting state of the art advice, basically, because you're surrounded by people who are going to encourage you, even when you have terrible ideas, and they're going to laugh, even when you tell a bad joke. Yeah. And um, I think that on a kind of individual level, uh, what that does is it's like, you see the personalities of some of these people, it's like at a certain point, they kind of come off the track. They've like lost touch with reality and they just stray further and further and further. And that's how it is that, for instance, at the end of the book, there's a scene where two of the Sacklers are forced to testify before a congressional committee. This happened just this last winter. And, you know, Kathy Sackler is one of the, uh, the longtime board members is asked like, you know, do you have any regrets? Is there anything you'd do differently? And she says, I've given this a lot of thought and looking back, there's nothing I would do differently. Um, and it's amazing, right? Cause it's like, I could, you know if I were writing a, a kind of a, a takedown or like an, like an editorial, which is just my views and not consulting them 
there's nothing I could write that would be more damaging than just giving that woman the mic in 2020 yeah. and letting her say that, letting her say how she sees it. Um, you know, I think that's, that's about as damning as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I think of that moment often now. Um, yeah. I don't even know what there to say about that. Uh, I want to encourage people to continue to send in questions. Um, I'll be incorporating those throughout the, uh, the rest of the talk. We have a question from Deborah, um, who, who was asking if the FDA uh, bears any of the responsibility for what's transpired with the opioid epidemic. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Deborah. The, um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, right? So I chose to write this book about the Sackler family and, and Purdue Pharma. Um, and I would, for a variety of reasons, I, I'd be happy to talk about, you know, I think that a great deal of blame uh, can be attributed to this family in terms of um, Purdue's actions in launching OxyContin and marketing strong opioids and trying to change the perspective of American doctors about how addictive these drugs are. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, that's by no means to say that, that they're the only ones to blame. And so you have other pharmaceutical companies that also made opioids. You've got dodgy doctors galore, um, and you've got bad regulators. And I think the FDA uh, uh, deserves a, you know, a great deal of scrutiny and blame for how we got to where we are today. The Sacklers will say in their defense, you know, they, they really resent their whole thing is they're like the opioid crisis is all it's like heroin and fentanyl coming from these foreign countries from Mexico and China, illegal drugs. And we only ever sold a drug that was uh, was approved by the FDA, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is true and indisputable, and and that would be like a like a trump card if you believe that the FDA is any good at its job. Um, but there are a bunch of examples I get into in the book. I'll, t I'll tell you the most shocking one. Um, there is a a guy named Curtis Wright who I who is a kind of a, a minor character in the book who was the main official at the FDA in charge of approving OxyContin when it was initially uh, up for approval from the agency. So not just saying it's okay, you can sell this drug, um, it's safe to do so and, and effective, but also approving the marketing language that they could use and the claims they could make about, for instance, how addictive it is. So Curtis Wright ends up approving it in record time and the drug goes on sale and Curtis Wright leaves the FDA and within a year, he takes a job at Purdue Pharma, making $400,000 a year. And um, I actually found a deposition with Richard Sackler, who's one of the members of the family, in which he says that Curtis Wright actually started calling Purdue asking for a job before he'd even left the FDA. So this is a kind of a flavor of corruption, right? Where it's not like they're passing a suitcase of money under a table. But instead, it's just like there's a job out there that, that could be waiting for you if you're a government employee and you sign off on this stuff. Uh, to give you a further indication of whether or not the FDA is something to hide here, when I was doing my research, I, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request uh, trying to get a bunch of documents from the FDA, and they weren't all that cooperative. So I sued them under the Freedom of Information Act to force them, to compel them to turn over thousands and thousands of pages of documents. I got a judge in New York to say that they had to. And one of my requests was for all of the communications of this guy, Curtis Wright, because we know Curtis Wright, you know, according to this deposition, he's like getting in touch with Purdue, looking for a job before he even leaves the FDA. He leaves and triples his salary uh, uh, working for Purdue. I said, I want all that guy's communications. And the FDA came back in the context of this lawsuit where there's like a judge overseeing this. And they said, oh, you know, it's the strangest thing. Um, all of that guy's communications have either been lost or destroyed. Uh, we have no real explanation. We've got nothing on, on that Curtis Wright character. Um, so that sort of thing, I think, leaves me with a, a pretty jaundiced view about the role that the FDA is, has played in, in this whole saga. You mentioned uh, before, in a, in a different metaphor, thinking of like the tree and the, and the branches. Um, and I'm thinking of the in the context of like a family tree now, um, in which you know we have Arthur Sackler and his brothers, but then you have these branches of descendants um, who are all as 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 I think is so powerfully made clear, who you know are doing things from like continuing to work at Purdue Pharma in a very active, insidious 
uh, honestly frightening um, in frightening ways and capacities. And then you have people who are doing social justice films and people who who like have want nothing to do with it. They're pretending their last name isn't Sackler. They're changing, you know. How do you, both myself and, and Carla, are wondering how do you sort of distinguish between and disentangle um, these different branches of the family and who is, and, and I think what's a really interesting question here is, is that of, of complicity, right? Like who is, who is actively engaged in this and what does, what does complicity look like and what does it, what would it take to not be complicit in this and I think you know that's something that's being wrestled with throughout the book like if you are um the woman who's the I forget her name but who's the filmmaker you know, is, Madeline is approached by uh an actor in one of her or it, it was Jeffrey Wright right yeah it was Jeffrey Wright and he's like you this you know these films this film company this work you do is only possible because of the sort of origin of this wealth that came that you know, that created this product that has decimated the lives of so many people. And so all that's to say, like, how do you think about distinguishing between family members and branches of the family and who's culpable and who's not? Yeah, I mean, I thought about this stuff a lot. And I, and I should say there are, I think these are kind of interesting moral questions about which reasonable people can differ. So like there were times my wife reads everything I write and we talk about it all the time. And we argued on and off about like the way I handled the Madeline situation. I mean, there's another big question, which is Arthur Sackler, who's a really dominant figure in the first third of the book. He dies in 1987. He dies before the introduction of Oxycontin. Yeah. And his, his heirs, they resent the even mentioning his name in the context of Oxycontin. Now, my feeling is uh, Arthur Sackler kind of invented the template that was subsequently used to sell Oxycontin. So I think that the, <clears throat> you know, I think it's absolutely, you know, you can say his heirs didn't profit from it financially. He didn't have a hand in it himself. However, there's a lot of the stuff that went on in terms of kind of um, breaking down the, the boundaries, you know, conflicts of interest, mingling medicine and commerce that was all Arthur Sackler mm -hmm. and like how you fraudulently market an addictive drug. Like he was really good at that and kind of blazed that trail. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was a significant story to tell. So there's Arthur Sackler, right? Then you have like the Sacklers who are on the board in the company, you know, looking at regular reports micromanaging how it is that Purdue does this thing. I, I almost think of it as kind of, um, it's like concentric circles of, of, of complicity. So th those folks are like the red hot bullseye, right? right. They're just like right in it. They're all over the emails. Um, and then in between you get these people like Madeline. So you have a lot of the younger Sacklers who say, um, and you know, they're like indie filmmakers and, um, they, uh, they have various jobs, but they, you know, they're not tend not to be in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and they sort of take great umbrage at the idea that anybody would suggest that they have anything to answer for. Mm. So, you know, Madeline, to the degree that she's talked about this at all, she just says, look, I do my work. I have nothing to do with the company. Um, I should be allowed to just have my work judged on its own merits. Um, mm. There was actually another Sackler, uh, second generation Sackler, but a young guy who's based in London, who's in the film business. And he, he gave an interview to the, the Hollywood Reporter like two weeks ago, in which he literally said like, it has nothing to do with me. And of course, for me, I'm like, I've done the research and I know that there are trusts in your name that have this money in them. So these people are worth like hundreds of millions of dollars that have come from the sale of opioids. Hmm. Uh, morally, I just like, I don't, Personally, I'm just not persuaded that you can say, I didn't work at the company, but I did take the money. So I have nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with me. Yeah. Um, I just don't really buy that as a, as a concept. And it, and it seems, um, you know, it seems like pretty faulty logic to me. To your question of like, how would you not be complicit? I don't know. I mean, I, you could speak out. You could, you could say, I don't want the money. You could say, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, you could do something that none of the Sacklers have done in decades. Uh, you know, they, they keep saying they're going to do it now, um, it, now that they're in real trouble, but which is to say, listen, I want to take some of this money and actually 
um, you know, devoted to addiction treatment, abatement, um, uh, harm reduction, which they haven't done. So I think at the moment when one of these younger Sacklers came out and said, you know what, I'll go out there and just and 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 live off my live off my job, live off of my independent films. Um, what I don't want is money flowing into my trusts from the sale of OxyContin. Mm. Uh, I think that would be, you know, you could you could make a pretty serious claim that that was somebody who had had really evaluated the situation and made a moral choice. What's really, I mean, frankly, was surprising to me is there are a lot of Sacklers and there's not a single one who has, like, there's no apostate. There's no person who broke rank in any way. Yeah. Oh, man, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I'm... I'm so fascinated by the, the questions of morality in and sort of embedded within this. I'm the I'm the kid who like when he first heard the uh, the trolley cart scenario was like, what would you do? And I was like, what's the right thing to do? Yeah. Um, and and this is a, you know a much <laughs> more real life um, material extension of of that in in some way. It's just thinking about what how does one move ethically given the harm that this, this thing has done is interesting. And I think when we think about morality and ethics, uh, something that I've been thinking about and a question that, that Gail has um, is, is how do we think about the relationship between, and you get into this in the final third of the book, um, the relationship between like the Sacklers and, and, oxycontin and philanthropy right and like you know there was for so long so many of these places i mean i i didn't i'm not from new york and so i think i took for granted or didn't fully appreciate the extent to which they were the sackler name was embedded in so much of the landscape of of new york city and in these elite new york city institutions and also i learned in in london and you know in in england and in and dc and dc um and you know for so long these places weren't they were like you know we took this money we you know these are great patrons of the arts these are great patrons of culture and society and then there's come a point more recently where places are saying we are not we are no longer going to accept this money um because of all you know i mean who's to say why i mean because of the negative press it seems but Part of what Gail is wondering is, is she works in philanthropy in New York City and we were and they were advised to no longer be taking Sackler money and she feels like that's a cop out and she's like surely other money is just as toxic Murdoch money for example do you think that other names will join the Sacklers in not having their money accepted anytime soon and and embedded within that more generally how do you think about you know again the question of morals and ethics uh like, how do we think? My big question, I know I'm embedding like five questions in one. My big question is like, how do we think about money that comes from bad places? And I'm gonna watch you and Anand's conversation on this because I know that he has like a very, a, a take on this. But how do we think of money that might come from bad things that can, that could be used in ostensibly good ways? And is there ever, in this context, is there is there justification for that? Like, how are you, is there ever justification for that? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I think these are incredibly complex questions and I don't mean to suggest for a second that, uh, that they're simple. Um, and, you know, in some ways this, this you, want, you want to hear a cop out, Gil, here's a cop out for you. Um, the, in some ways as a reporter, you know, I kind of go out there and, and describe what happens, um, and and I'm like I'm I'm sort of freed from the the harder job of of like prescriptively saying what should happen, right? So so I describe Nan Golden, the artist, launching a campaign to try and force uh, art museums to take down the Sackler name. Um, I've also talked to people who work at some of these museums who are terrified by this because they say. Uh, look, of course we find the Sacklers distasteful. If we could go back in time, um, you know, maybe we wouldn't have made these deals, but the reality is that uh, we've got a bunch of other board members who, you know, might not stand up to a, a, 
some kind of an ethical litmus test. And also, if we start taking names down because people fall out of favor or because there's new revelations about bad things they've done, you know, we'll, we'll, how are we going to strike a naming agreement with some new plutocrat, you know, next week who's going to say, well, I'll give you this money now, but how do I know that you won't mm. turn on me in 10 years? So I, I think particularly for institutions that are really cash strapped, um, I, I don't mean to suggest for a, for a second that these are easy calculations. I know they're really hard. Um, there's also obviously legal considerations. So um, when Tufts University uh, took the Sackler name off of its medical school buildings, in part because there was a revolt from medical students saying, I do not want to attend classes learning how to be a doctor in a building named after this family. Um, you know, it's a pretty untenable situation for that medical school. And, uh, you know, the Sacklers, some would argue with good reason, said, okay, but that's a breach of contract. We had a contract, you know. Um, so I, I don't mean to suggest it's easy. Um, I think what really struck me when I first started working on the Sackler piece in 2017 was that there it was a moment of historical reevaluation of names, like the, the Calhoun College at Yale had, had just been renamed. And there was this sense that we were looking back at historical crimes um, and, uh, you know, in a way that I think there was a great deal of support for, frankly. I mean, there were obviously dissenters, but a lot of people were very supportive of this names were coming down. It did strike me as a little bit odd that in the case of Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers, I felt as though the crime was kind of ongoing. I mean, that was my intuition in 2017. Fast forward three years and Purdue Pharma pleads guilty a second time to felony charges. So I was, I was kind of more right than I, than I knew. Um, having said all of that, I look back at the history, you know, I, the first place where the Sacklers really started giving money is Columbia University. And I went through the archives there and you see the relationship between the family and the university. And I just feel as though it's very often the case that these are, um, whether it's a university or an art museum, that it's relationship with its donors. When you start reading the like the interoffice memoranda from the 1960s, you realize that, um, you know, it's not just pure generosity. Uh, Arthur Sackler's longtime lawyer said something, which I, I quote in the book, where he said, um, if you want your name on it, it's not charity. That's a business transaction. Mm. And so I feel as though there is a there is often a kind of cold calculus behind this stuff. Um, and I do feel as though a lot of these institutions are forced to kind of compromise, um, you know, what what should be their ideals. The tricky thing, you know, and, and, and frankly, I think to the degree that a lot of these places can kind of fly under the radar, um, you know, I don't like Yale University. I, I don't, I, they used to have a Richard and Jonathan Sackler Institute of some sort. So they take down the Calhoun name, they leave the Richard and Jonathan and, the, and like in terms of that bullseye, like Richard and Jonathan right in the center. Um, I think some of these places, if they can kind of fly under the radar, they will. Um, where it gets awkward is when there's a lot of publicity and there's somebody like Nan Golden who has this kind of strange identity where she's She's recovering from an addiction to OxyContin, but she's also this revered artist whose work is held in all of these galleries. And so she has a kind of clout in that world. And I think it makes it unsustainable. Um, so I don't, I do not have a, a pat answer here. I think it's really, really hard. And I think, you know, if the Met takes down the Sackler name, which they might actually in the, in the coming months, mm -hmm. um, they, they apparently are sort of reassessing or something now. Um, you know, there'll be other people who say, okay, well, what about all the places named after the Cokes um, yeah. at the moment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in my book, it's um, it's a similar question about like monuments right now, you know? Can you, like, can you just back up and, and tell people a little bit about the book for those who don't know? I mean, this is, we only have a few minutes left and this is- Come on, your, come on, a little bit. Stuff. I mean, it's about different places across the country and how they reckon with or fail to reckon with their relationship to the history of slavery. And so I go to different historical sites, monuments, memorials, cities, plantations, prisons, and kind of explore um, to what extent are these places confronting from, running from, or doing something in between with regard to how they address slavery on that land. So a place like Monticello, um, where Jefferson lived, a place where like Angola prison, um, which is the largest maximum security prison built on a former plantation. Um, the Blandford Cemetery, the, where 30,000, the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers 
are buried, one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country. Um, the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, uh, which is a plantation surrounded by a sort of constellation of plantations that where people hold weddings and, you know, use the bridal suite, use the slave cabins as bridal suites and, you know, do all sorts of things. And, and in the midst of it is Whitney, which is very committed to um, telling, making sure that that plantation is a site of reckoning and remembrance and that a, a, a plantation cannot be anything other than, uh, cannot be understood as anything other than the torture site. Um, mm -hmm. And so are doing some very different work on that plantation than others are doing. But, but yeah, so I go to these nine different places across the country. Um, some of them are doing it well, some of them are doing it quite poorly. Um, but the center of the book is a question of memory and like how we, which is, is interesting because when I think about the ways our books are in conversation, um, I, I keep coming back to um, what, what do you do how does our one how does our memory of things that have transpired shape how we make sense of what's in front of us um are we all operating with the same information with which to like even make that decision i think the sacklers are trying to i'm not this it would be wrong of me and this is an event that's recorded so it'll live in perpetuity but like if if the analog is the sacklers and the confederates right where like you are trying to create a situation in which people are operating the confederates lost the war and then tried to create uh engaged in a sort of epistemological war where they tried to make it so that people were operating with fundamentally different sets of facts right like we didn't fight the war over slavery and it's like well you you did and you said it right like you said it right there and you said it here you said it on the senate floor you said it in the declaration of confederate secession and it's interesting right because there's like a similar sort of thing happening with the Sacklers where it's like, this didn't happen. You know, this isn't because of that. It's here. like, yeah. but you, you said it. Like we're looking at the documents. We're like, we, you know, it's right. an right. empire of pain. Like right. you see, you know, in all of these, these briefings. So um, we only have a few minutes left and maybe if you can very briefly speak to, um, you know, since this is Oklahoma, this is virtually Oklahoma, um, the 2019 settlement that happened with Purdue Pharma, um, that was among one of the first uh, state settlements that happened with the company. Could you speak briefly about that and the sort of implications that that had on, on what we see happening now? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have to, it's one of these things where I, I could talk to you for an hour, but the, um, but the, just about that, but the, uh, as, as many of you will know, uh, tuning in, um, there was a big settlement, a $270 million settlement between Purdue Pharma and the state of Oklahoma, um, as I mentioned, <clears throat> you know, after Oklahoma, there there were forty eight other states lined up with their own lawsuits. And uh, interestingly enough, I think the the magnitude of that settlement with that one state was part of what ends up getting us to where we are today, which is uh, Purdue Pharma basically ends up in bankruptcy. And there's a sort of a proposal to just take care of all of the litigation in one fell swoop. Like the last thing they wanted to do was uh, two, you know, $270 million settlements in one state after another, after another, after another. But you end up in this kind of perverse situation uh, now, which is that um, over the course of about 10 years, the Sacklers pulled money out of Purdue. Um, they, they took at least $10 billion out of the company uh, over the course of about a decade. And then um, eventually, when they've taken almost all the money out of the company, they push it into bankruptcy. So it's as if they've kind of looted their own company. And then they push it into bankruptcy and they say, oh, God, it's too bad about all these lawsuits. You know, the thing is, the company's really down to down to almost nothing at this point. So it, it declares bankruptcy. And, and a bankruptcy court is where the whole end game is going to play out now. And there's there's questions that um, we don't have time to get into, but but interesting questions that I would I would uh, encourage all of you to keep an eye out for about, um, you know, what accountability would look like, whether there's any version uh, of accountability for the Sacklers, uh, for Purdue. And I do think that we'll have the answers to some of those questions in the coming months. Um, there's so many more questions. There's so many things. I do, we're gonna do two, a lightning round of two very short things. First is there's just a lot of say nothing love, understandably, as the president of the club, uh, I, I understand and I can't go 
without allowing all these people asking say nothing questions to to be left behind. Um, a lot of people are asking what you think about what's going on in Northern Ireland right now, um, and and how you again this is some it's a hard lightning round question, but um, people are curious like where they can find the best information um, and and yeah just like w what your thoughts are on what we see transpiring over there in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I mean it's 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 scary. I you know I, I wish we had longer to talk about it. Um, I it's it's incredibly alarming for those of you who haven't been following. There's been a uh, a great deal of renewed unrest over there, um, you know, uh, riots in the streets um, and and violence and, and some chaos, um, you know, driven by a number of things. I think driven in part by the fact that you have a lot of young people who don't have jobs and um, don't have a clear sense of, of, you know, what their future might look like. And so there's a kind of a sort of nihilism driving some of this, but I think Brexit is also driving some of it as well. Um, and you have uh, obviously incredibly ineffectual government, um, uh, both in, in London uh, and, uh, and in Northern Ireland. Um, so I, you know, I, I read the Irish papers. I, I, I always do. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to, uh, to keep up with what's going on. Um, and um, yeah, it's, I, I, I wish I could say I was more optimistic. The one thing I'll say just, just to not be alarmist is, um, I don't think the troubles are coming back. I often get this question, like, are the troubles going to come back? And I don't think they are. I think um, on the margins, we'll see this kind of event, but this is nothing. This is like a good day in the old troubles. Mm. Um, and I just think the, the conditions that existed in the late 1960s, early 1970s, that really kind of kicked off the troubles, um, it's just very, very different now. So, uh, so that's, my, that's the, the mild reassurance that I can offer you. And the last question, um is uh, everybody's wondering what you're working on next. Oh God, um, I honestly have no idea. I'm gonna like take a nap. It's been a- yeah, you deserve it's it. Been, it's been a busy year. I'm supposed to uh, I'm supposed to get back into stuff with The New Yorker. Um, we keep arguing about what I should be writing about. Um, uh, so if anybody has any good ideas, uh, you know, re reach out to me, hit me up. Um, I'm, I'm always on the, on the lookout for a good story. Indeed. Well, this has been uh, an honor and a pleasure. And um, I hope, again, I encourage all of you to get your copy of Empire of Pain. The link is right there in the chat by 7, by 17. Um, let's, Pre -order uh, book. <laughs> let's make sure this book is, is uh, sold out at, at all places. So Patrick, this has been a, a delight. Thank you so much for yes, thank you. Thank, you so much. thank you all for joining us. And I think Magic City is coming back on to. Are they coming back? Okay. I think so.